Hi, this is Mike Knezovich, and welcome to the latest edition of Toot Up with Mike and Monty, Thinking and Feeling Good. I'm here in Chicago today with Dr. Monty Pavaluri on a nice autumn morning. How are you today, Monty? Doing great, Mike. Fun to be doing this. It is. It always is. And I always look forward to learning because usually I learn as much as any listener does during these things. So in this installment, we're going to talk about something called reward circuits in the brain and the role they can play in mood disorders and other problems. We're going to focus on a particular region of the brain called nucleus accumbens. Don't worry, we won't get too deep into it, or at least not any deeper than I can take. But uh, Mani, what do we need to know about this area of the brain? Nucleus accumbens is just a small pea-sized region in the brain, just below the cortex in the almost lower middle part of the brain called subcortical region. And nucleus accumbens has two parts, a shell and a core, and it is understood to be a key region in anticipating reward, and it is connected to emotional circuit as well as reward circuit and plays a key role or central role in the nexus of these two circuits. Okay. Um, well, that tells me where it is now, and it tells me the function it serves, but um, I guess one way to put it is in a, in a, I hate to say normal because it seems like such a, a judging term, but in a, in a person who's healthy, is not suffering from any kind of uh, mood disorder or, or, or similar uh, disorders, how, how does it function? What does it do? So nucleus accumbens, you know, the functionality is actually understood much more carefully through animal studies. And we can't always translate animal studies into human studies, of course. So they are complementary in informing each other, right? So mm -hmm. I'd be really going by a mixture of findings from, you know, the translational research across species, if you like, you know. So nucleus accumbens ha does this important function of uh, uh, reaching for the reward when one sees a reward. And it has a functionality of liking something, you know, and it tells you, I like this. I like McDonald's, you know. And then the it is connected to other parts of the brain regions like amygdala that say, that tells um, nucleus accumbens, I want it, I want it. And then uh, nucleus accumbens also has a function of wanting as well as liking function within it. And it has two parts, as I said before. The shell protects you from going all over the place looking for the wrong rewards, whereas the core helps you to go to the specific target of the reward you know in I like that specific reward I want it and it goes and seeks it and that sort of anticipation and wanting it and liking it is the function of the core and the shell modulates uh, by um, reducing the distractibility of going for wrong rewards and helping you to get the right rewards. So the core and the shell of the nucleus accumbens work together in reaching for the reward in sync with amygdala. And also what is so fascinating is the prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain, that, um, actually helps in evaluating and uh, deciding on what reward is okay to go to get as well. So it is intricately connected region, this nucleus accumbens, right? It sits between thinking parts of the brain and feeling parts of the brain and does its job in reaching for the reward. Okay, so it's sort of sending these signals, but what you do with them, the amygdala is also involved. Yes, yeah. yes, the okay. emotional part, you know, it's a... Uh, area, amygdala is the area that receives emotions and reacts to emotions. So you brought up McDonald's. <laughs> so let's say I have a French fry from mm -hmm. McDonald's mm -hmm. and, I, and I like it. Mm -hmm. So that information is stored that I liked it one other time. In the, I've already liked it. So the next time I see it, mm -hmm. um, uh, th this, this mechanism will remember? I mean, not remember. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Know. So yeah. the way it works is nucleus accumbens is connected also to hippocampus. Okay. And the hippocampus stores old memories from okay. your previous 
uh, uh, experience. And amygdala is also connected to hippocampus and nucleus accumbens. So it says, oh, I want it. Remember that memory that you had and enjoyed it? And then nucleus accumbens says, yeah, you like it. I like it. So they all talk to each other. Okay. And that's where, and then if, it's the right time of the day and your parents allow you or you yourself <laughs> allow, then you kind of say prefrontal cortex hopefully is functioning and say, oh, let's go get the Mac French fries. So, uh -huh. Like that. Yeah, so I need to learn to... <laughs> <laughs> we all need to learn about this then. Um, so uh, what can go wrong here? I mean, um, I mean, well, you can eat too many French fries, but that's not a that's that's sort of a, a not a real problem. I mean, in, in uh, it, when when things go wrong, why are they going wrong, and and w what what problems can that create? Surely there are um, other than French fries. There is there are things like cocaine, and there are things like marijuana, and various other drugs that people want to take, you know, on the street and. Uh, this nucleus accumbens, if it if one has experienced these drugs and liked it before, they might want to reach for it if the brain is not functioning in all these regions appropriately and the environment triggers are not overwhelming the person to kind of create these uh, negative memories through experience and context as well. So there is a nature and nurture interface, of course, and I don't want to talk biology as the quintessential only process here but you know experiences shape your brain function right? right so so that is important to acknowledge but that said let me um, tell you that um uh, the way it works is especially when there, re there are emotional disorders like uh, mood disorder, depression, like depression bipolar disorder. Okay. Um, so there is a lot of self-medicating that goes on, you know, and there could be just substance abuse by itself and emotions, emotional problems could be secondary like depression. So that the reason behind this comorbidity or coexisting disorders is that all these circuits of emotion and um, reward are interlinked, you know? And so um, the people who are depressed might show or actually have shown through functional magnetic neuroimaging, that's the brain studies that show brain activation, that nucleus accumbens showed lower activation. Lower, yeah, activation. lower activation and similar uh, relative to healthy controls, you know. Okay. And similarly, in bipolar disorder, it shows lower activation to um, in the nucleus accumbens relative to healthy controls when there is reward shown. So it's almost like they need a higher um, level of reward for them to be appreciating a reward. Okay, so can we circle back to the depression? You say it has a, a lower activity level, like with this functional, mm -hmm. the imaging of the brain that we've all seen exactly. now. So it, it doesn't light up as brightly or something. Yeah. So that means that when I see something that I liked in the past, I don't, it's kind of, in simple terms, I don't get as excited or I don't get I don't Ordinary get that stuff. sense of reward or, or anticipate it enough to do something about it. Or yes, your motivation is lower okay. to reach for the good stuff that is good for normal, regular, everyday situations. Mm -hmm. When you're depressed, you want a bit more excitement to motivate you. To you know, the regular amount of motivational targets are not doing the job for you. Okay. So you rev up your need to seek the you know, more excitable stuff to kind of get to where you want to get to. So unfortunately, but then the good rewards could be ample and provided to kind of distract you from being stuck with the negative seeking of negative rewards in the situation. So these brain function helps us to recognize and educate us as to what would be uh, at stake in these disorders. However, though, the pattern of activation could be different in depression and bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. um, for example, in prefrontal cortex, medi medial prefrontal cortex, that is the medial wall of the brain, could be like um, underreactive or overreactive. Somehow something is not right there because that's the area where people ruminate in depression and that's closely attached to nucleus accumbens, for example. Hmm. See, in, in bipolar disorder, the emotional control region, that's the lower part of the brain, 
called ventrolateral prefrontal cortex is underactive and it doesn't control amygdala very well. So it's almost like there are several things are at, you know, uh, dysfunctional level in both bipolar disorder and depression, but the pattern is somewhat different in each disorder, but the nucleus accumbens itself is lower in activation. On the other hand, in substance abuse per se, mm -hmm. there is overactivity in nucleus accumbens, and there is that kind of relative difference between healthy controls and it is activated and excitable to want the rewards. So um, there, there is also amygdala overactivity in the substance abuse, similar to the emotional disorders when the substance abuse is present, mm -hmm. so that there is increased dopamine levels also supplied to nucleus accumbens um, and as well as glutamate, a chemical from amygdala. And all of these things are increased in nucleus accumbens in wanting to, uh, you know, get and, and becoming excitable and wanting a reward. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sometimes deficient dopamine can also want you to seek reward. So there's too much dopamine or too less dopamine. Either one is a problem. Um, so what are the, I, I guess... Um, when it comes to somebody, uh, well, f first off, when you say comorbidity, you mean the, the coexistence of these things, right? Like you could you could be bipolar and have substance abuse problems, yes, but they might not be caused by the same thing, or or they might, th or they might, they might, yes, yeah, but it's yes. not necessarily so. Yes, because what we're saying is co coexisting disorders are complex. Mm -hmm. They have multiple brain regions involved. Some of the regions are common across all disorders in the pattern of activation. Okay. Whereas some areas react differently or activate differently um, uh, across disorders. So the way we understand brain is that depression has its own signature and depression uh, with the mood, uh, by, sorry, substance abuse disorders have its own signature, and substance abuse disorders by themselves have a different signature. So what we need to understand is something is at, something is seriously wrong. So for example, if you give in bipolar disorder stimulants, say dopamine, yeah. increasing drugs, mm -hmm. then there is increased activity in both amygdala and nucleus accumbens and there is more excitability sometimes caused in vulnerable population and they might get really aggressive I see you know and they might want drugs to calm themselves down I see in depression on the other hand um, they are um, probably not activated enough and want drugs to get themselves excited so the physiology is different the reasoning is different and why they seek drugs. Right. That is fascinating and complicated. Um, so when it comes to sort of treating people, which mm -hmm. you do, um, where, does, where does thinking about this stuff, like the nucleus accumbens, um, you don't run everybody through a, a, a brain image to, to find this stuff out, right? Or do you? I don't. I don't know. I mean, but 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 you are conscious of this as you're trying to sort of ferret out those signatures. Is that right? I mean, is that a way of putting it? When you say that each one of these things has its own unique signature, yes. I'm just trying to figure out how you identify those things. But so usually at this stage, it's only educational in value. Yeah. So because in humans, we can do non-invasive functional magnetic neuroimaging, but yeah. we can't really um, examine the um, uh, imaging uh, on a regular basis on an individual patient in okay. a clinical service. I see. So um, we are informed by these differences and we use medications to subdue um, bipolar mania or uh, help depression with antidepressants so that there is um, normalization in some of the regional activity of the medial prefrontal cortex and amygdala and nucleus accumbens um, so that the, these dysfunctional circuits could be set to normality or baseline. Mm -hmm. But this and so this work is just informing the professional community about what's going on, and 
it's a constant process, isn't it? I think so. And I think that we are in an exciting neuroscience um, uh, era where we have the privilege of helping uh, to ex uh, helping families to understand that there is such a thing as brain disorders yeah. and there are these regions like nucleus accumbens along with its connections to prefrontal cortex, amygdala and uh, also basal ganglia, other regions of the basal ganglia and it, it would be really uh, uh, informative and people can have a newfound respect and seriousness towards making a difference in these people's lives to see how treatment can be effective rather than um, uh, uh, negatively perceiving that uh, it is uh, a behavioral problem uh, that is poorly understood and, uh, and criticized. That's, that's, that's terrific. I mean, because there is something about somehow seeing imagery and having this sort of explanation makes it real and not sort of a character flaw. Absolutely, you know I mean? exactly. Yeah. It, is, it is a really deep human suffering yeah. and understanding brain really is a window to uh, the modern world of finding new discoveries as we move forward. We live in exciting times. Um, all right, well, I think it's time we have to go, uh, even though I think we could keep talking about this for quite some time. But we'll be back and we'll be talking about other parts of the brain. And uh, in the meantime... Thank you again, Monty. It's always a pleasure. And until the next time. Thank you so much, Mike. Let's do it again. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>